everybody. And then if you want to talk, you just have to unmute yourself. And then you, sh you can like, you know, pop in and say, hey, I have a question and we'll stop. So anyways, um, sorry, I'm looking at a bald eagle and I'm making sure he's not checking out my chickens. Okay, so um, you may hear my chickens. My rooster likes to start yelling. You may hear dogs. You may hear me yelling at my chickens because they try to calm my back porch. So I'll try to keep the noise down to a minimum. So anyways, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm recording this. And so if you do not want to be part of the recording from here on out for privacy reasons, then you might not want to put your video on um, when you're talking um, because this will go up on our website for everyone to be able to look at later that wasn't able to join us. And we've got a lot of people who asked me to record this because they couldn't join right now. So um, you also have the ability to do comments in the app. So if you want to like raise your hand or want me to stop, you just want to ask a question through text. You don't have voice. You can do that there also. So I'm going to hop over to pre presentation mode. And we will get started. Okay, so first of all, um, this is our April meeting. We're going to be talking about winter autopsies, splits, clean rearing, and our May to-dos. First of all, autopsies. Um, what you want to do is take pictures to refer to later, or show someone who is help to, to show someone who is helping you. Um, and I also like to do it because um, a lot of times I kind of forget in the heat of the moment and. Um, I need to kind of go and review things and say, okay, so where were the bees? And is it obvious that they were near honey? Were they not near honey? Were they um, in an awkward place um, in a frame that they couldn't cross? So that's a really good thing to do. Um, make sure you dump your bee bodies away from the apiary in case they attract maggots. Um, and um, the possible reasons for death are starvation or um, moisture was dripping on the bees um, from above them. Um, maybe there were warm, cold fluctuations outside where they break um, their cluster and then they don't get back in cluster in time. Um, if you have really strong winds and you didn't put up a wind break, that can cause them problems. Or if you decided not to do insulation. The <clears throat> weak hives um, going into winter is another reason, whether it's from size or disease. Um, you have to have a really good, strong amount of bees in order to have a proper volume to um, volume to surface area ratio for them to cluster in our area up here. And so if they're um, if you don't have a good solid eight frames of bees, at least solid on both sides, or if there's any disease present in any way, there's a good chance you're going to lose them. Um, another thing is if they start brooding too early. Um, so if we, if you had gotten a hold of some Italians, um, or something from the South that is a warmer weather bees and they started brooding up early because they're used to brooding up more early from in the Southern States. And then a cold snap comes along. The bees are because they're trying to cover the brood rather than stay warm for themselves. They'll end up dying and freezing that way. So that's another reason. <clears throat> After cleaning, set up your hives in an apiary in single boxes with a frame of brood wax comb. So that's any comb that it's obvious that brood was in it because it's very much darker than the honeycomb uh, because bees love that smell. So put one frame of brood comb in your hive and then the rest of it um, empty, maybe a couple a frame or two with foundation or not. But you want to leave that open. Remember for swarm traps, bees like the idea that it's something is pretty roomy. And then they, um, and then you can just kind of leave it in your apiary. And there's a good chance that before you even get your bees or trap your bees, bees move in to that empty box. So that's just a way that you can reuse it. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna bounce over here to the meeting just to make sure that I don't have anyone trying to log in. Nope, we're looking good, okay. So an update on my winter experiment. I lost all my bees. 
Now, before you go, oh my gosh, the person leading the club and giving some advice lost all of her bees. What is she doing? Mine was a special situation. So let me explain. Um, I purposely disadvantaged my bees in order to do an experiment for my master's beekeeping course with the University of Montana, which I'm starting um, this June. And I disadvantaged the bees in order to prove what is the best way to overwinter bees here. And I did it traditional ways that I knew were not going to work because I've lost bees that way before. And the other problem that I had is that I did not start with an early nukes, healthy bees that had plenty of time to build up. I used swarms that were caught at the end of July. And so their numbers and their resources were not built up the way that someone had um, purchased them in May and they had been building up the whole time. If I were keeping bees with the intent to make them survive as a hobby beekeeper, I would have combined, I would have picked the strong ones, killed the weak queens, combined them, got bigger, stronger, giant hives going into the winter and they would have survived. However, that would have inhibited my ability to do experiments where I needed at least five different setups to experiment for my club to see what is the best way to winter in Montana. So I knowingly went into the winter with smaller hives, weaker, weaker colonies, um, or bad setups um, just so that I could run um, the monitors for the, um, I was doing humidity monitors, temperature monitors, and weight monitors in order to see how they responded to the different setups. So here's the results. The one that died first, um, hive number five, was a Lane's wood, two inch thick that I built myself with absolutely no insulation and it was vented up top in a traditional way with a, which, with a rating factor of two if you're looking at insulation. So it was an R2. And <clears throat> the temperature swings were way too varied um, using my um, FLIR camera, my FLIR camera, and um, also the um, temperature gauges that were running in there. You could see that in the warm sun of the winter, it was heating up way too hot. And then at night, it was losing all of its heat. And so it was big temperature swings because of the lack of ventilation. They perished in a warm cold snap um, somewhere between the 31st of uh, December and January 7th. And an autopsy showed that they had broken out of cluster and then got caught and froze. Um, hive number four, the vented quilt box. Um, it, so that was, this is a traditional wooden box vented at the top with a traditional quilt box up top. I did put blue board wrap around the actual brood boxes themselves. And that blue board gives about a factor of R10 ish. The reason I put ish is because the, all the hot air was escaping out of the top of the box. And you could see it with my, um, my flare camera and you could see it based off of the temperature gauges. And so it's, it might've been insulated on the walls, but it wasn't insulated in that it was properly holding in heat. And that hive was consistently 10 to 20 degrees colder than any of my other colonies. So even though it was a healthier hive, it struggled because it was losing hot air. They, they also were bees that had Southern characteristics. Um, they built huge amounts of honey, huge amounts of brood really fast. Those bees tend not to do good in our winters, probably a lot of the Italian flavor in them. They died about January 15th. Um, so then um, hive number two was a nuke made out of polystyrene, which would have an R factor of about eight. Um, I knew that they were going to struggle going into the winter. Um, give me one second here. Somebody's wanting to join. Sorry, give me one second. Okay. She's going to be popping in here in a second. We got Elizabeth coming in. Maybe. There she is. Okay. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm just talking about my, um, how my winter experiment went. Hopefully you can see my screen. <clears throat> um, I knew they were going to struggle because I detected deformed wing virus in them. 
This was one that I had off site for the whole entire season and I ignored it and didn't really check on it or its um, health. Um, I was just happy for it to be sitting over at Rebecca Farms. By the time I got a hold of it and brought it back to my apiary, I realized that it had been hit probably pretty hard by the mites. Um, they die January 25th. Now, it's unfortunate because I was trying to test for you guys to see, can you keep bees in a nuke um, if it's insulated in a polystyrene in our area? And um, I'm going to have to repeat that experiment this next year with a healthy hive because I don't know if they died from cold or if they died from the deformed wing virus. So that one's a fail. Um, hive one was a two deep polystyrene with a um, R factor of eight. Um, there were not enough bees to make it to the spring. They did great. By the time they died, finally, February 14th, during a little bit of a cold snap, um, they had about, um, they were about the size of a, a baseball left. So that was just a matter of not enough bees to keep her and the bees warm to make it all the way through to the spring. And remember, again, this is because I purposely did not combine my hives to make them stronger. The last one, I was so excited about them. I thought these buggers are going to go all the way to the end. They were in a two medium polystyrene R8. Um, I wanted to see, can we overwinter bees in smaller sizes than the typical two deep brood box that everybody tells us to do? So I did two mediums instead. And the answer is, yeah, possibly. Um, they, I finally lost them April 15th, so not long ago. I went in there and the bees that were left was, again, a baseball, actually golf ball size left around the queen. Um, I found all of my queens and all of these and they were, there was brood. So that means that they tried to brood up, didn't have enough bees to cover the brood, didn't have enough bees to keep themselves warm and her warm. And so they perished around April 15th when we had those really bad cold snaps a couple of weeks ago. So, um, but again, those bees were very much disadvantaged. I caught them July 31st, which is incredibly late. And they struggled to build up. And the fact that they lasted as long as they did, only being about half the numbers I would have wanted to have in a hive going into the winter, I was really impressed. I'm just sad that I don't have those genetics anymore to grab onto. So um, before I move on to the next one, any questions? So, hey, Angela. Yeah. I, I believe that ours are in two medium boxes. So... Your oh. problem was that you didn't have enough bees in there or was it the type of boxes they were in? No, I didn't have enough bees. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, they were, they were light going in. I knew that they were going to have a problem. They just didn't have the population, the numbers. Okay. Um, okay. You're, su you're supposed to have a good solid eight frames of bees. I probably only had five. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah we definitely had a lot more than that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, any of you guys that had bees in May or June were going to, you know, just um, have a lot of advantages being able to get through the winter, so. Okay, so just a second. I heard another ding. I just want to make sure no one's popping. Nope, we're good. Okay, <clears throat> so why am I not concerned my bees died? Well, I have hundreds of pounds of honey and wax. That picture there? all those boxes so there's one medium and three deeps i believe or is that three mediums i can't tell from the angle i think it's two yeah one medium three deeps and then those two boxes on either side you see there are layens frames every one of those frames is full or three quarters full of honey and i have a lot of honey to extract and every one of those frames has fully drawn comb and so when I start catching bees this year, I'm gonna have so much honey to give them. Um, and I can, you know, like save some of these or at least a lot of comb. And we all know that comb is the precious gold resource um, for our bees. Our seasons are so short and they can't store honey and make comb because they have to eat honey to make comb. And so for me to have comb for all of these swarms that I'm gonna be getting this year, is just, you know, going to do really well for them. 
Um, secondly, I lessons were learned. I learned what you can do and what you cannot do, the limits that you can push the bees to. And um, I have um, data collected, um, both for myself in making my decisions to see what temper temperature fluctuations do and what the bees do and where they actually cluster. And also for my um, master's certification for my um, research paper that I have to do. And I have bees to trap. I've already got thousands of bees checking out my boxes and my traps just on my property. I haven't even gone out and put my traps on all of the properties that are normally do around the valley. So there are tons of bees here. One second, I've got somebody, oh, my sister's coming in from Colorado. So she's popping in here. All right, so um, I'm not gonna have any problem collecting bees. I've got, like I said, bees hitting my boxes here. And um, once they start to swarm, um, I'm not gonna have a problem getting any more. So I am not bothered at all that I lost them. So you guys shouldn't be either if you lose all your bees from one year to the next, it's not a big deal. So <clears throat> sharing time. Does anybody want to talk about what happened to their bees or ask any questions? I'll pop back over here to. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So does anybody want to talk about um, or ask any questions about their bees for this last winter? Or did everybody's bees survive? Ours, this was obviously our first winter with our first, with our two hives, and they both survived. One is still stronger than the other. You can tell there's a lot more bees. They're a lot more active, but we have not unwrapped them yet. They're totally wrapped still. So okay. I, I'm not sure when we should unwrap them. <laughs> Um, I would say when you see it not freezing at night anymore, I mean, right. they have it to the outside, right? Oh yeah. 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 They, yeah. they're, they're coming in and out. They're flying like crazy. And I've got some one-to-one -one sugar water out and they've got pollen patties in the top. But even before that, they were coming in loaded with pollen, okay. you know, I, I, some kind of willows or something. I don't know, but, but yeah. they were very happy. They've survived. Um, our first time around but you know we want to be cautious and not open them too soon although i really want to get in there and look at everything <laughs> <laughs> I bet, yeah um yeah i um and has peter given you, did he give you any direction is there where you can reach out that's, 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 that's. <sighs> he did quite some time ago i haven't talked to him again this year and, and honestly, he's back up in Canada, so I'm not sure what's going on up there with everything else. So I, I probably should call him. But at some point, we're going to have to grow up and take care of him ourselves. Right. Well, I know for me, if my bees were still surviving at this point, I would be leaving their blue board insulation around on them um, until I was not seeing freezing temperatures at night. Yeah. yeah. Like, and that's the same like with the mite treatment. Uh, um, uh, when we got them last year, it was, I want to say in May, yeah, I think we got them mid, mid to late and May. they had already been treated for mites. And then we treated them obviously in the fall and everything. So I know we need to treat them again, but isn't that very temperature regulated? It depends on what you're using. So oxalic, mm -hmm. if you're using oxalic acid, you can use it now. Although mm -hmm. if you already have brood, those mites have already made their way down into the brood and the oxalic acid does not penetrate that cap. Okay. So, but you could at least treat the adult bees that are, okay. you know, um, right. there are um, other products that will not work um, in certain temperatures. And so do you have a particular product you like to use? Yeah, what do we have? Do you, do you remember what it is? I think it's called Might Be Gone. Might Be Gone. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, is it? I, it's actually out of Canada, I think. Let me Hang on, he's going to go get it. Yeah, um, I would look at the label. I did, and, and I actually went to the website, and it's a little confusing, but I think what I got from it was that it really is very temperature dependent. You know, it has, the temperatures have to be above a certain um, you know, fifties or sixties, I think. 
And I do think if I was reading this, I do think it works on brood. So okay. I, I don't know. Joe's going to tell you, and I could be 100% wrong because that has happened. Gone. What is it? Might gone. Might gone, but what's, what's the acid. active? Formic acid. Oh, yes. Formic acid is dependent on the temperature. Yeah. So um, if you want to go to the Be Informed Partnership, okay. So Google Be Informed Partnership. There's a whole entire section where they tell you all the different mite treatments and all of the ways you should administer them. Okay. At the of year, that's going to be your go-to for mite treatments in one place. Okay. I I know I read something and maybe that's where it was. I don't know. I just Googled it and said I'm using formic acid, and yep. and it said, but I do think it works on brood. So I'm. It does. I'm, oh, it does. good. Okay, good. Does everyone always treat for mites? I mean, is that something everyone always does? I mean, I personally don't, but that's because I don't have a financial investment in bees. I'm catching swarms and I, I'm more of a um, naturalist in that I make bee centric choices. Mm -hmm. And so I personally believe that eventually the bees will develop Well, they already have the tools, but if we left them alone, bees would have exhibit the traits that they need in order to take care of mites. Mm -hmm. It would mean deaths of the ones that do not have that ability. And so there's a lot of people who are saying, okay, but as a hobbyist beekeeper, I'm not willing to let some of my hives die. And that's fine. I do not judge them. I personally don't. But if your intent is to keep the bees alive at all costs, through your winter, then research shows that the mites are one of the reasons that kill them in the winter, and you might make that decision to kill mites. So it's really, why are you doing what are you what you're doing? What are you trying to protect? Are you trying to protect monetary investments? Or are you trying to let bees just um, through evolutionary process survive on their own? So, okay. so you're idea. actually breeding bees to to be resistant to mites. Yes, Is that what when, I understand? when you split from your survivors. Those oh, that's interesting. exhibited those traits to be able to deal with mites on their own. And they do have the traits. However, there's a couple of things going against them that stop that from happening. The first is that um, if their um, forage is compromised and they're getting poor nutrients, and especially if neonicotinoids are involved, it's going to cause them to not exhibit the traits that they're supposed to have. It actually creates learning disabilities we're discovering. And if you want to know more about that, I did a Free the Seeds event, and it's on the um, flatheadvalleykeepers.club website, where I talk about how neonicotinoids actually could be affecting our bees' health. And so that's one of the, one of the things that we're fighting against. So do you have any more questions about that, Elizabeth? No, that's good. I, yeah, I was just confused because I know that some, I thought some people were doing what you said and I wasn't sure. So, yeah. Um, and I don't know what everyone in the club is doing, actually. I provide um, all of the options. I've had people come in and talk and provide both options. So we had the, um, the entomologist, uh, the Montana entomologist came in and she did a presentation about um, all the different ways you can treat for mites last fall. And so I'm a big believer in present all of the information to everyone and let them make their own decisions. Yeah, that's, and that's nice. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Does anybody else want to ask about um, what may or may not have happened with their bees this winter? I got a question about the coming bees. Sure. Since we're getting the uh, nukes, what, uh, what food do we need to have ready for them? And what method do you prefer or recommend? Yeah. Um, so you're going to do one to one sugar to water ratio. That is not by volume. That is by weight. So, um, I, you know, I need to put this on the website because it's going to be something that people ask a lot. I Googled it. And so I don't remember the exact ratios, but it's not one cup of sugar to one cup of water. It's varied because it's actually by weight. And okay. so that ratio promotes the bees to think that there is a nectar flow and they will start building a lot of comb with that sugar water. They'll also start packing it into that comb. You do not want to overdo it because you will honey bind your queen. Honey bind means that the bees start packing all of the nectar into the cells and then the queen doesn't have anywhere to lay. Okay. And 
Um, and so you usually have a brand new package or swarm or nuke. You feed them for two weeks and then you stop. Okay. Now, and yes. any any pollen patty now or? Um, you you could if it's bad weather. I would do a very small chunk. I wouldn't do a wouldn't full size pollen patty. That. Um, the bees do have the ability to go get the, their own pollen right now, but not if the weather's bad. Okay. For the sugar water, how do you provide it? And how close to the hive and do we worry about robbing? Yes, you will have robbing right now because we're, it's still winterish and the bees are gonna be struggling for um, their resources. And so you'll potentially bring in other bees that will cause robbing. Um, and so I would suggest uh, my favorite way to feed is what's called a top bar feeder. And I'm sorry, top feeder, not top bar, top feeder. And it's essentially um, a rectangular um, plastic case. And you put the feed, you put the the sugar water in it and put the lid on and you set it on top of your inner cover. And then you put your cover over that. Okay. So we actually have a couple of different ways to feed. Just, oh, look at that baby. I thought I heard a chicken. <laughs> so I'm so jealous because I want chickens so bad. We moved here from Florida and we couldn't have chickens. And we moved to Montana and we live in an HOA and can't have chickens. Uh, honestly. Yeah. So we have a couple of ways. We have the, um, it's like the size of a frame and it's got the little cups that go down in it and there's there's sugar water in there and they can climb down in. But because we hadn't opened them up yet, we actually got the mason jars that um, are, are in the feeders that attach to the hives. They don't attach to our hives though. So literally we just set them a, a few feet from the hives and they're loving it. Although Angela, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, with the mason jars, do you just keep them open on top? Because I, I read something about inverting them, but I didn't understand how. No, well, it's an inverted it, they kit. They are inverted, yes. It's an inverted kit. We actually bought it at Murdoch's. Oh, uh, okay. Thank oh, okay. you. So, so here's the top feeder that I was describing. It looks like this. You can get this at Murdoch's. The oh, bees, okay. The bees enter up through here. You okay. On top of your inner cover, because this is so thick, you go ahead and put a medium empty hive body around this oh, right okay. without frames and so this is sitting on your inner cover remember your inner cover has a little hole that matches this that the bees can climb up out of the inner cover and then what they do yeah i like that is oh i don't have it on here um, but there's a little plastic piece that fits over this and it has holes and the bees can um, climb in on here on the sides and they can get and they can drink the nectar but because that dome is covering it they can't drown oh okay and yeah nectar. um so yeah and so they climb up in here and what's awesome about these is that when you want to refill this you just lift the lid um off of your hive that uh, that telescoping lid and then you lift this up and the bees can't fly up at you out of irritation because you've opened this, this that this is containing, and so you can pour sugar in here, put the lid back on, and then cover them up, and they and never even have to put a veil on. Oh, okay. um, um, so these are super nice. You can get these at Murdoch's if you can't, if for some reason they're not selling them anymore. Um, just Google a top feeder. Okay. Um, the problem with the, so I've done the frame, the frame like feeders before that you're talking about. The problem with them is that the queen can fall in and drown. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will tell you the problem that we have with those is we do lose a lot of bees. A lot of bees die. Yes. They That's do. true. They even, drown. Even with the ladder. And you're like, okay, girls, you see the ladder, right? And they <laughs> stay on the ladder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And they don't stay on the ladder because they're hard-headed. Yeah. <laughs> hard um, the, problem, the problem with the Boardman feeders, and the Boardman feeders are the feeders you're talking about, the mason jar yes. um, with an insert that goes into the entrance. Um, that attracts robbers from everywhere. Right. And yeah. but Now, to be honest, we didn't put those on our hives because our hives are not compatible with those. So we set them a few feet from the hives. Mm -hmm. And and they're loving it. They're all over it, but they're coming to it instead of uh, instead of it being on their hive. So maybe that 
you know, maybe the robbers aren't getting into the hive that way, you know? So I, I know experienced beekeepers that do what's called open feeding, like you're talking about. And so no judgments, as long as it works for you, it works. You'll know when it stopped working. Yeah, absolutely. You'll have, you'll have every bee in the county coming in down. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we do and we don't know. Yeah, That's possible. We might, you know, we get the neighborhood kids. We might have the neighborhood bees too. <laughs> Well, it, it's okay as long as um, you're, you don't see ro robbing activity at the front of your hives. If you see what looks like bees balling each other and attacking one another, okay. then you're compromising your bees and stressing them out in the way you Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. So. so now you mentioned about the ratio. Um, should I go change mine? Because I definitely did it by volume. I would. Yeah, I did not do it by weight. Yes. So. Um, so if you did it by volume, then you technically did more sugar than water. Yeah. And so you're, um, it's not the end of the world, but it's definitely going to make them think it's more like fall where they're the, it's more concentrated nectars and they think okay. they're prepping for fall. You want them to know it's spring and that's what the one well, they, they haven't had it for very long. So, okay. I'll, I'll go. And, and how long do we continue with this feeding? Um, to be honest, I, I don't know. Um, I've never fed my bees in the spring. I'm kind of like they're established. They're doing good. They can go out and find their own stuff. Honestly, I think that's what Peter said too. We started feeding ours because everybody on every single there's, one site. I know there's people them. that do down on Montana beekeeping forum. They were talking about feeding. The The reason that you feed is not to help them survive. It's to get a jump on production. Okay. okay. So that makes sense, Angela, because honestly, Peter said the same thing. He's like, these bees survive. They're, yeah. they will survive. They've survived every winter and he was really good at overwintering and they, they live. And he said, don't feed them too. But even surely, surely the brand new nukes that we're going to get, we would need, we would yes. need to feed. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you do. They need to, they need to establish, they need to start building good comb. So you're feeding to get them to build comb. Because for them to try to use the resources that they're getting from flowers to just stay alive and to build comb in a newly established hive, it's too much. And so you're feeding for a good two weeks. Um, some people feed until the bees quit taking it. So when this thing starts to get moldy and it's obvious the bees aren't taking it anymore, they take it out and that's when they quit. So they kind of use the bees as their you know, guide. So, um, so you're, um, just keep in mind with, um, you know, with the trippies, with the feeding that you can honey bind her. If you just give them more and more and more and more nectar, and then yeah. she won't have anywhere to lay. Cause they I, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to just stop feeding them. I think, and I'm just going to pull that sugar water and not feed them, you know, and hope for the best. All right. So we're going to pop back over to the um, the um, presentation here because we're going to get to a part that it sounds like a lot of you might need to be sorry I'm having a struggle in here is you might be getting to this part so splitting all right why would you split? Colonies reproduce each spring and often through the summer here in Montana by splitting or what we call swarming. If you don't split them, they will split themselves. Um, plus a sustainable apiary propagates from its winter survivors. So you don't wanna be spending money every single year on more nukes and more nukes and then only to lose the ones that survived half of the hive, get leaves and sometimes half leaves again and again because they're secondary and tertiary swarms. Um, you can ask Ingvar about that. And so um, you want your apiary to be sustainable. And the way you do that is by splitting them before they decide to split themselves. So who wants to do this? Well, in Northwest Montana, you only want to do this with winter survivors. I do not suggest attempting to split newly captured swarm or this year's installed packages or nukes. 
One year I did that. I got greedy because my nukes were looking really good that I had installed a couple months before. I split them and they did not make it because, well, they, um, they made it for quite a while. But I ended up having to kill the queens that I bought from Peter and consolidate them back down to the original queens because they were not going to make it. They had not built up to the eight frames of bees that they need to have and the 12 frames of honey that they need going in. And so um, we're, our seasons are just too short here. So um, I would um, just only suggest doing it for your survivors. However, your survivors are definitely going to need to be split because they're very well established and they're going to be prolific with their laying in the spring. When do you want to do this? You want to split when you first see drones flying. Um, they emerge 10 to 12 days old um, and when they're, they emerge out of the hive and right about then they're reaching their sexual maturity. The bees knowing this decide to go ahead and start making queen cells once they have mature drones out flying. So um, usually for us, that's going to be within a couple weeks after the dandelion flow. Dandelions are blooming now. I wouldn't call them in full flow, um, but they're definitely blooming. There might be microclimates in town where the dandelions are in full bloom. So the bees are going to be collecting pollen and nectar um, from all of the resources around here, like the dandelions. And then they're going to have all of these resources packed in. They're going to start brooding up like crazy. And then they're going to get full. They're going to fill up their space. Their resources are going to be too high to the amount of brood. And so there's a pheromone trigger that tells them not enough brood pheromone, too much food, not enough space, half of us need to leave. And they um, exercise the queen, and don't let her eat for a week. She gets slim. They take the queen and she takes anyone who can fly. So all of your foragers and they leave and they go find a new home. And um, you don't wanna lose your survivor queen. She made it through our winter here. So you wanna hang on to her. So that's um, when you wanna do this. <clears throat> so how can you do splits? So we're gonna cover that more in depth in the next slides. There, you know that saying, ask 10 beaks? There's tearing off splits, walkway splits, vertical splits, nuke splits, swarm controls, cut downs, shook swarms, Mississippi splits, OTS, and I'm sure there's probably another 20 more, to be honest. So try the one that you are least intimidated by um, one year, maybe add another in the mix the next, and then report back to the group what your experiences are. So I've decided to highlight some of the ones that um, might be the most applicable or look like the most fun for us. The first, this one's a really popular one. It's called the Terranov split. Um, essentially, what you do is you lay a sheet out on the ground with a board coming up um, to reach towards your original hive. And it's about four inches away from the entrance. And there's also a towel or a rag uh, tied to the end of the board to kind of create a cluster effect um, to drop underneath there. You literally take every single frame of bees and shake them out onto the sheet and then put all of the empty frames back into the hive. What's interesting is all of the bees will start running up this board and they'll, the, only, the only ones that can bridge that four inch gap are the ones that can fly and so the ones that can fly all go back in. All of the nurse bees and the queen get stuck back on the board. They'll actually go underneath that sheet and hang on that rag that you see is hanging down there in a big cluster. And in the evening, you just take that cluster over and you drop it in your new hive, your second hive that you've established, a split, and you're done. And you've got the forager bees are in one and the queen and all of the nurse bees are in the other. Why do you split up the foragers and the queen? Well, because the queen, the nurse bees can't fly yet and they're not going to start slimming her down and then telling her, come on, let's lift off and go swarm somewhere because they can't fly. And so all of the ones that would prompt her and force her to swarm and fly, those flyers, they're now back over in another hive split from them. So that's the idea behind it. 
Um, <clears throat> you, um, if you want to know more about how to do this with a whole bunch of pictures, I would go to the site that I have here, honeybeesweet.com, and you can read about tearing off splits. So then there's a walkaway split. A walkaway split is considered an easy split because you don't need to know the queen's whereabouts. You literally split the hive evenly between two boxes, um, same number of brood frames, same number of honey frames in two different boxes. You don't know which box the queen is in. Um, you can shake two extra frames of bees from the old hive into the new because any foragers that you split and move to a new hive, those foragers remember where they used to live. They're going to go back to the old hive. So the idea is that if you give a little bit of extra bees to the new hive, that um, it will kind of help that their numbers are going to dwindle down as the forager bees leave and go back. Um, this can only be done on a hive that has no swarm cells. If you get into your hive this spring and you see swarm cells, you do not want to do a walkaway split. You have to know where the queen is. And the reason why is because the queen, if she gets left in a box with swarm cells, the bees will say, yep, we got swarm cells, we got new queen, no problem, we can lift off and go swarm. And you don't want them to. You actually want them to think that there are no swarm cells, they have no other options. This queen is the only thing they have. And so you do not want to do a walk away split. But if you don't have any swarm cells yet and you just want to split the hive and they're looking pretty good, you can do that. Now, again, you're not going to do this process though until you've seen a drone because you can't, your new queens that you're going to make can't get mated unless there are drones. So you wouldn't do a split this weekend, right? Unless somebody's seen drones. I doubt it in the valley, but that's what, that's what you want to wait on. Um, again, these same, this split is also talked about at honeybeesweet.com. So I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, so then there's a swarm control split. Um, you're going to use this when swarm cells are already present. What you're going to do is you're going to move the queen to a new box with only one frame of brood, but you're going to replace it in the same spot that the old one was in so that the foragers are the ones that return to it and only the foragers. Then you're going to remove all the swarm cells from the parent hive that you took her from. Um, except two to three young, strong ones. Just a second, somebody's dinging and wants to come in. Sorry, one second. Okay. All right, we got him in. Okay, Bruce is coming in there. All right, go back to presenting. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to remove all the uh, swarm cells from the parent hive, except for two to three strong ones. Um, so the, this, that was probably really confusing what I talked about. So I'm just going to, we're going to watch this little YouTube video together to see what this is called. Um, this is called the Pagden method for doing a swarm control split. And there's no sound to it. So you're not missing anything. <clears throat> so essentially you have a hive that has a queen and queen cells in it. You're going to take the supers off if you have any. You're going to take off a queen excluder if you have one. <clears throat> um, you see the spot where the box is in right now. Um, then you're going to move the hive to the right by three feet. And then you're going to take this new empty box and you're going to put it in its place. Now, remember how I talked about how foragers want to come back to the original spot they're used to. So this is going to capture all the foragers. This is kind of another way of doing that tearing off split. You're going to remove, um, well, obviously remove the roof off or you can't do anything. This whole part of the video is kind of silly. And you're going to remove the inner cover. Now you've got 10 um, foundation empty frames in this empty hive. And what you're going to do is you're going to find the frame with the queen in it from the original hive. And you're going to pull that frame out. 
and you have to remove any queen cells. If you don't want to remove queen cells because you need them, then just grab the queen and grab a different frame of brood and put her on it. And you're going to put her in that empty box that's in the old spot. And then you're going to leave a couple of queen cells in the other side. You usually want to do around the same age. Why do you want to do around the same age? Let me pause this really quickly. Because if you have a queen cell that's very, very mature, and then you have another queen cell that's five days behind it, the bees will, once that first queen um, emerges, they will potentially say, hey, we've got another queen cell here. Uh, you know, we can go ahead and swarm because then there will be another queen cell left. And so they'll go ahead and swarm on you anyways. However, if the only the queen cells that are in the colony are the same age, then they will hatch or hatch is the wrong word, emerge at the same time, fight to the death. And then you'll have your strongest, most viable queen. And then the bees don't think they have second and third options, so they won't swarm on you. So that's the idea behind only leaving a couple of queen cells and only ones that look like they're about the same age. All right, we'll go ahead and play this again. So. You, after two days, you feed the hive and with the queen cells, according to the video. It's playing, right? Is it playing? Hello? Okay. Um, after six or seven days, you're gonna move the original hive to the left of the new hive. So, come on, little graphic is, there we go. So this is the um, original hive with the queen cells in it. You're going to move it to the left. And this bleeds off any new flying bees from the original hive and tops off the new hive with foragers. So um, again, this is presentation is going to be on the website. So if you want to see that again to understand how to do that, but that's essentially how you do what's called a swarm control split. That's if only if you already have swarm cells and swarming is imminent and you're just trying to mitigate that. Next, we have a nuke split. Um, we have a special guest with us that just came in. He has been my mentor for the last year or so, an online mentor. And he explained to me um, that this is how he does nuke split. So what he does is he places the queen with three brood frames, one honey frame, and like one empty frame into a nuke box. And then 10 days later, you're going to go into the original hive and you're going to have several queen cells because once the hive went queenless, the bees are going to start raising queens out of the eggs that are remaining. And you're going to split those up into nukes in the same way. Take a frame that has these queen cells on it and put it in a nuke box. Give it um, a couple more uh, frames of brood and then some honey and then an empty frame. So you're not going to be left with a whole hive at this point. You're going to be left with multiple three to four probably nukes. And um, for us in our area, you may want to consider buying mated queens instead of letting them raise their own queens if it's you're doing it late in the season because we have such a short season and you don't mind the cost. Um, it will get you a jump on um, getting brood started if the queens that you place in there are mated rather than letting the bees raise their own queens. So that's a essentially a nuke split. Um, if you've ever watched um, or followed Michael Palmer, he is really, really big on having um, half as many nukes as he does hives going into the winter because nukes um, are have vigor, what's called, you know, um, new bees vigor because it's a new queen. They're very prolific, they're very strong. And you can use nukes to replace your bees in the spring if you lose any, um, any of your hives. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to do the queen rearing part because it might answer a lot of questions you guys have about splits and how the splits work. And then after we get through this part, then we can open back up for questions. So 
Um, queen rearing is allowing your own bees to raise a queen instead of purchasing them. The pros are it's free versus anywhere from $30 to $60 plus overnight shipping or driving. Um, you could drive down to Livingston. I did find a queen supplier down in Livingston here in Montana. Um, <clears throat> there's also some in Bozeman. Um, another pro is the, the DNA from your winter survivor queen. It, it's DNA from your winter survivor queen plus the drones from other colonies, survivor queens in your local area. So you're getting local bees that were able to survive our winters. And then finally, the bees pick their preferred queen. And bees are picky about the, who they're going to pick next for the queen. Um, so that they do not, they don't just turn any old egg, um, into a queen. You can read more about that online. Um, the cons, um, are the time lost in the bee population buildup in our season. Um, there's, I've got a little graphic here where you can see on day one, the egg is laid after three days, the egg hatches. And then on, um, day around eight, the cell is capped. And then on day 16, the virgin queen finally emerges. So here we are 16 days out from when you did your split and our queen is just emerging. And then anywhere from four to 10 days after emerging, she's gonna go on a mating flight. And then when she, if she survives the mating flight and gets back, um, the earliest you can expect to find eggs is another two to four days after that. And so you're looking at anywhere from 24 days out from the day you did your split to up to 35. And if you do your split, let's say that we have drones the third week of May, then you're looking at 35 days out from the third week of May before you actually have eggs being laid again. And then of course, those eggs are gonna take 21 days before they're um, in their brood phase before they emerge. And so 21 days before you even have brand new bees, nurse bees in the colony. So you can see how this is going to be time intensive. Again, there are some pretty strong pros though, if you're willing to, if you're willing to be patient. So that's the, what you have to weigh. Another possible con is the risk of virgin queen getting killed on a mating flight. And that does happen. And everybody reports something differently. I've heard as high as 30% and I've heard as low as I've never lost a queen on a mating flight. So those, that's what you're looking at for the cons. So um, how are the different ways that you can raise queens? We'll go from the easiest. Are there swarm cells present? Um, and so you can see right here, Tony, this is what a swarm cell will look like when it's actually capped and has a queen in it. So that's what they look like there. Um, there's no special action needed from you at this point other than splitting the frames with these cells up into splits, um, split hives or nukes that need queens. Um, only leave a few cells of the same age to avoid secondary swarms. The bees have done and will do the rest. So this, this is a no brainer. Um, if you get into the hive and you wanna do your split and there are no queen cells, you can make room um, for them to make queen cells on the fly using the on the spot queen method. It's a book by Mel um, Dissel Cohen. Um, you can only buy it at this site, mdasplitter.com. What he's doing is he's notching underneath. You can see the eggs there in that close up in the bottom of the picture. He's breaking the cell wall down underneath there with his hive tool. He does this in about three or four spots around, and he does it where you see the little tiny curve of the egg, meaning that it's about a day old um, and some eggs. And the only reason you do this is because when you split and take the queen out of the hive, they are going to have to turn any old egg that they have in there into a queen. And they technically don't have room um, to make a really good big queen cell because of the way those the combs are jammed up against each other with only a quarter inch difference in, in the hive, right? And so you're essentially giving them room so that they can make these nice big cells unhampered, unhampered um, on these frames. So that's the only point of breaking down the comb. Does it work without you doing this? Yeah, sure. We have a guest on here who does not 
probably bother to break down the comb. It's just um, a suggestion that people have when you're trying to make room for the cells. And so again, this is if you don't have any swarm cells yet and you're gonna be splitting them in whichever way you've decided to split them and you just wanna give them room to build big queen cells. Um, the final, this is the hardest one, um, the most advanced one. Um, this is queens for pennies. It's a grafting technique by Randy Oliver. It's best used when you wanna make dozens of queens or if you wanna borrow eggs from a local beak without taking an entire frame from them. They might be willing to give you some eggs if you know how to graft or some larva rather, but they don't wanna just hand you a big beautiful frame of capped brood and that's understandable. Um, this is a, an advanced technique it takes three tools. You need a grafting tool, you need magnifying glasses, and you need um, these little cup cells, or cups rather, uh, for the queen cells, a little plastic ones. Um, so um, if that's something you wanna know more about, I have the link there to scientificbeekeeping.com. You can watch videos. Um, this They teach you how to do this at the journeyman level for the University of Montana. So it's very advanced. I just wanted to throw it in there so that uh, for anyone who is just curious about the process. So finally, purchasing queens. If you're concerned with a short Montana season, you can purchase virgin or mated queens by mail. Um, so I encourage you to go to our website and the resources buying bees page. And I am, um, I've put a call out onto the Montana beekeeping forum asking for people in Montana who sell bees or queens. And as people are responding to me, I'm adding them on that page. And um, the one thing I can say though, is always ask your bee club first if anyone has any extra queens or queen cells to donate to you. Um, maybe they found a bunch of queen cells and they're thinking about destroying them and they're gonna get in there tomorrow and do it. And you've just barely caught them in time. So definitely put a call out to our page or call me and I'll find out if anyone has any queen cells to donate to you if you find yourself queenless. The other benefit is if you're going to do splits and someone already has a queen cell that's very um, advanced, you're that much far ahead. You're not going to have to wait for several days for them to uh, cap that and for um, her to emerge. Okay, so before we do our made to do's, I'm going to bounce back over here to the meeting and see if you guys have any questions. Any questions? What do you what do you do with somebody else's queen cell? Do you just put it in your hive or you sure do. Um, it's easier if the queen cell if you if you were on foundationless because the the original beekeeper can just cut her out of the comb and and then just give, give it to you. You just place it, you just you know, squish it essentially. Um, without squishing her into the comb. It's a little bit harder when the original beekeeper has um, the queen cell sitting on foundation. Uh -huh. uh, some people use clippers and clip around and, and cut through the plastic foundation. That's doable. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be messy and the bees are going to be irritated with you, but it's possible. Yes. Um, okay. It's a little bit easier if the cells are all the way at the bottom of the frame because they'll, they'll just be hanging and you can yeah. almost break them off with comb, with burr comb, without destroying yeah. them. If she's compromised, okay. you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I threw a lot at you guys, really. You're just, you just don't have to do splits now. You're all good. I've been watching about them on YouTube, so I'm. Uh, good for you. <laughs> it's so interesting. <laughs> Angela, there's so much information there that um, I when know. We to to Neden to to split or Queen. Trust me, we'll reach out. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You'll have to peruse the presentation again. Yeah. Click on the links. There's, there's a lot yeah. of interesting stuff, but you know. And I tell him, I think our strong hive. I think that they're going to have to be split this year and this will be our first time. So you'll hear from us. Exciting. <laughs> well, and I mean, the first decision you'll make is you'll get in there and you'll see, if you see drones flying around outside, you'll say, okay, time to split. 
and then you'll go in and you'll, you'll inspect your hive. If you don't see any queen cells, then you're gonna decide on one kind of split. If you see queen cells, then you're gonna go with another. So it really depends on the status of your hive once you get in there. Sure. Well, once we open her up, we'll see. Yeah. And then we'll call you. <laughs> Um, is there anybody on that has ever done a split that wants to offer their experience and what they think is the best way to do it? Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll just assume that you guys just needed some time to process. And so we'll move on and look at the made to do's. So going back over to our presentation. All right, so May to do's. This is your last chance to clean out dead outs. Um, and um, <laughs> sorry, the chicken's cracking me up. <laughs> She's very friendly. <laughs> A little, little bossy. Little bossy. I was just saying, I want a chicken. I'm so jealous of your chicken. <laughs> what the um, so then um, you want to make a plan for actions for the. Whoop, I'm sorry. I bounced out of my own screen, clicking on things. Okay, I'm getting it back. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. So last chance to clean out your dead outs now. Um, and the reason I say that is um, I've got all of my dead outs set up as traps right now. So um, make sure you get that done soon. When I was cleaning my dead outs out yesterday, I was inundated with bees they could smell the honey and the wax and they came from everywhere and um, it just made it a little bit more complicated so definitely get that done soon make a plan for actions and inspections for the season and research the splits that i talked about pick a split and plan on doing it um, get your swarm traps out see our website for swarm trap presentation in the resources and ask friends and family if you can set up traps on their properties. Um, sign up to be on the swarm call list on our website's uh, swarm center is in the menu. It says swarm center. Um, I also have a form there for people to report swarms. So we're, as people report swarms on there, we're gonna go through the swarm call list. There is an option you can do that you wanna be solo um, for swarm calls, or if you wanna do an assisted, meaning that I will come and mentor you and um, watch you and help you while you capture the swarm. Those ones I'm gonna have to space out by availability. So if I'm not available at that moment, if I'm at work um, or in the middle of something, then I'm going to give the swarm to someone who can do it independently. Um, so that'll be dependent on my time to be able to come out and mentor that. <clears throat> um, you have two days left to sign up for the free Beekeeping 101 at Pennsylvania State Extension. Um, that closes at on 4.30, not the class. You have weeks to, to actually do the class, but you have until 4.30 to sign up. It's free because of the virus. They're doing that right now. Um, and um, you'll want to go to our website, and it's on the blog section. I have a post with a link directly to it. Hey, Angela, have you talked to anybody who's actually signed up for that? I've been trying to sign up for it for probably two weeks now and have been unsuccessful every my, time. My husband we signed up for it. Did, were you able I to get through? Yeah, yeah, we went, it was not a problem. We, we signed up, got registered, and uh, you had to go through a whole checkout right. thing where you had to add it to a cart and then yes. you checked out. I did that. Did. I can get as far as the cart. And okay. I've never gotten any further. It, it, it starts the spinning wheel. I've tried it on my phone, on my laptop, on my iPad, on my computer. And for whatever reason, it's always just locked me out at the cart. I'll try it again. I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I yeah. call them. I call them Tony. Yeah, you know, it's probably user error, but. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, uh, it's good to know that somebody's been able to do it. So I, uh, you know, yeah. I have a, I have a way to go now. You know. Yeah. Um. So, um, if you want to sign up for the Apprentice Online Beekeeping at the University of Montana, that opened up Monday. Um, it's kind of costly. I believe it's about three hundred bucks but it's worth it. It's $300 well spent. It's several weeks of classes. Um, it's a stupendous program. The only thing I would say is that um, th the reason you might want to do it, or you could test out of the apprentice level for $60. And uh, can I get you guys to mute yourselves? I've got lots of sound happening. Those of you that unmuted, if you could remute. Thank you. Um, I just am so like easily distracted. Like I'm having a hard time, um, you know, reading the stuff off when I hear other noises. Sorry about that. Um, so um, it, one of the, you can test out of the apprentice level for just $60. If you're confident in your beekeeping skills, um, you've been doing it for a year or two. The reason why you might want to do that is not necessarily to go on to the journeyman or master beekeeping, but because they're offering a brand new course this year, it's right in the middle of it right now, but I'm sure there'll be more. And it's a natural beekeeping course. And it's being done by an instructor that is, um, is not using chemicals and is allowing the bees to be in more natural settings, to be much more hands off in their approach anything that you would associate with natural beekeeping. And it was mentored and sponsored by Thomas Seeley, who I've mentioned several times, who does a lot of research into the wild bees and how bees like to keep themselves. And so he's using that in him as a guide to kind of help him with a course. You cannot take that course unless you have done the apprentice level. And so it's either take the apprentice level or test out of the apprentice level for $60. So I just want to um, put that out there. Do you have to take these courses to be a good beekeeper? Absolutely not. Experience is a great teacher. Um, you've got all of the people in this club that have been keeping bees that you can ask them how to do things. This is just really for people who are curious who are knowledge hungry, who want to take things up to the next level. It is not mandatory. It is not necessary for success. Um, even beekeepers who are master beekeepers still have bees that die for various reasons. Um, it's more about experience. So um, I don't want anyone to feel intimidated or pressured or feel like they need to take these classes in order to keep bees. Um, finally, um, you want to sign up to be a mentor for our brand new beekeepers on our mentorship page. We're not asking you to be a public speaker. We're not asking you to have all the answers. It's really just, I get a lot of calls from people that are saying, you know, want to ask things like, when I put my queen in my hive, which direction do I turn her? And um, those kind of questions can be answered easily by anyone who's ever installed, um, you know, a hive before. And so that's where you guys can be really helpful. So any of you that are willing to mentor first year beekeepers who usually have very basic questions like what's the difference between a drone and a worker? And you can help me out and kind of ease the burden of the questions that I'm answering if you can do that. So please go to our mentorship page on our website and check that out. Um, for any of you that haven't um, been there, I'm gonna pop this open really quick. So, this is our new site. Hopefully you've seen it. FlatheadValleyBeekeepers.club. Um, you can see here a uh, getting started section. This is for um, everything that you might need to know um, about getting started. I've got a list of all the books, all the equipment, all of the classes, all of the um, resources for bees. The blog here is where I'm going to be posting news in kind of a format you would be expecting from Facebook, you know, recent posts. And um, there is the link right there that I talked about. And then the mentorship is here. So if you guys could think about hopping over and being mentors, I'd appreciate it. Um, and then all of you guys are probably already signed up to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, so any new site posts here in the blog will come up. 
and um, the meeting minutes will be, I'll be sending out a newsletter with a summary of the meeting minutes. And so with that, um, my presentation is complete. So I'm gonna bounce back over to the meeting here and open this back up. Does anybody have any questions or comments or wanna share any stories? Hey, Ange, um, I thought maybe, would you like to share with them what I just experienced with my newbies as of two weeks um, yesterday? Yes. And I thought I thought it was a swarm and it wasn't. And uh, I thought I would share that. That might help someone else identify exactly what's going on, what you shared with me. Sure. First, hi, sis. <laughs> this is my sister, Danielle, everybody. She's down in Colorado. So she called me yesterday um, in a panic because her bees, what looked like, had completely swarmed out of a new top bar hive. They'd only been in two weeks and they were filling the air. And so she opened the top up and she looked in and there were no bees inside the hive. Um, but she did notice a clump of bees uh, that were um, hanging underneath the hive and she had a screened bottom to this top bar for ventilation because it gets hot there. And so she was standing there and she's going through the frames trying to figure out what's happening and the bees all go back in the hive. So the, the um, cluster that was underneath crawls up, crawls back in the hive and all of the bees that are in the air go back in. And so um, she, when the bees were out and she was looking at the frames, what she saw was frames of brood and, but several of the frames were completely filled with nectar and she had been aggressively feeding them for at least a couple of weeks. So um, my suggestion, because um, I've never had this experience before, was that she honey bound the queen in the way that the brood nest was set up in the frames in the top bar and the queen could not cross those frames of honey. She won't cross for some reason. Queens tend not to walk on honey frames to get to empty comb to lay eggs. And so their, the um, brood what because they didn't have anywhere to lay they weren't happy with the hive that she had them in they felt like they didn't have enough room they'd only been in a couple of weeks and they absconded on her but for whatever reason the queen did not successfully get up in the air she ended up landing back underneath probably the hive where she could smell the original hive and they all came back to join her realized they weren't taking off with their queen successfully and so they went back in so this is my theory if anybody else has any suggestions of what they think may have happened or had any experiences we'd love for you to share nope yeah, I was trying to unmute and my my sure. mouth wasn't working. Uh, we were saying she has a completely different hive than ours, but I don't know if you remember last year, Angela um, Ingvar had to come over and help us. Yes. That's exactly what happened it, to us. The, well, yeah. It was the, our queen went back under the screen and they all swarmed around her. They built and, comb under there. Yeah, and he just came and scooped them down into a nuke and we put her right back in and all was fine. Yeah. He, we, what we think happened was she went out for her um, flight to with the drones to breed with the drones or mate with the drones and couldn't get back in or didn't get back in or whatever. And she went under our screen board and all the bees went with her and they built comb there and we had no bees inside our hive. They were all on the bottom. So, oh, yeah. yeah, I and I remembered that happening to you too, and that's a common thing when you have screen bottoms is for the bees to be attracted to underneath, especially on mating flights. And this this technically was not a mate. She had brood, so I don't right. think this right. was mating. I think it was an abscond. Now there are several mm -hmm. reasons that bees can abscond. Um, it could be that they were unhappy with the size of it. Like I said, that she became bound and couldn't lay anymore. Um, smells will make them abscond. They don't care for sounds. If there's vibrations on the ground, if you've been running lawnmowers around them, um, that's more common with brand new bees. Once bees are established, they won't abscond just because you're running lawnmowers around. Mm -hmm. Um, 
animals bothering them, if skunks were scratching at them, cows are scratching on, you know, leaning on them. So, um, you know, that was my theory of why they absconded. Now I've got somebody here. It looks like Bruce wants to say something, but he's not sure how to unmute. So Bruce, um, the way you click once on your screen and here, let, I can't unmute you because for privacy reasons, they won't let me. So if you click once on your screen, some little icons should j jump up from the bottom and you want to click that microphone so there's no longer a line through it. I don't know if that's working for you on the app. So it comes up from the bottom. Yeah, I noticed if, if you're on your phone, if you actually click on your picture, it'll bring you up and then you click your picture again and it pops up right on the upper part of the screen instead of the oh, bottom I part of the screen. I got it. I got it. Hey guys. Yeah, I never had that happen. All the bees leave. All the bees left? There were zero bees in there? There was zero bees. It looked like they were shot out with uh, like their... I mean, they just came shooting straight out and then it went straight up above me. And it was like a tornado of bees above me. So uh, not one bee was in there. And then when I took everything off as quick as I could, all the bars, um, I noticed that little puddle under. So it went underneath my hive in between the screen and the stand. And then all of a sudden I saw a, a ball of bees. And then I just see them start crawling back in. And then as soon as those that cluster crawled back in, I see this mass amount of bees just coming straight down and right back in the hive and started getting, started doing what bees do uh, normally right away. Uh, and, uh, and then that's when I um, obviously called my sister and then she explained what I had to do was to get things closer to the opening. And Angela, I can let you explain what you told me to make sure, uh, uh, you give them the right directions, but it did work. So I have happy bees right now. I don't know if I have a queen. I couldn't find her today, but they're just as busy. Um, I did take her advice. I was feeding them outside of the hive because I was worried about how many wasps we have in Colorado going into the hive. I changed Already? that. Now I'm, um, what was that? Already? Oh yeah. Like massive. They're hungry and they're awful. So what I did is I put the feeder um, back into the hive um, at the end of the hive where there's no entrance, where it's plugged. And, um, and, and then um, I closed that up so they couldn't make hive in there. I've got my divider going. They're super happy as of today, really gentle. And I haven't seen that since, but it was a mass exodus. That's the only way I can explain it. <laughs> That's weird. I learned something new every day with these bugs um what i wanted to comment on what angela was talking about the swarms i kind of like getting a lot of swarms like i love free bees so it's great to be on a swarm list i'm on like five of them and in seven years i've never gotten one call from any of them. maybe your swarm list is different but um the best advice i can give to people who want free bees is to go to like vista print or something spend 10 bucks you get 500 business cards put your name and number on it free swarm removal everywhere every gas station grocery store just anywhere you can think of number number one and then number two is if you go to free, you can make a free business free call it like joe's bee removal make it a bee removal page with your number on there and you will get calls all the time i went on five calls today and got five giant balls of bees for free so just definitely do that. I mean, um, it's like the best idea to get to try to get free bees and then so much. I'm sorry I missed the first part of this group. I, I got home late. I'm not sure what, what the team this is. Is this like a is this like a regular bee club or is it um, like a natural beekeeping group? We've got a little bit of everything here. It's just the county bee, the Flathead County Beekeepers Association here. So uh, we're we're pretty not judgmental, and so we've got everybody doing a little bit of everything here. Okay, yeah, and then then the other thing I would say, I'm not sure how new everybody is, but even if you do get a swarm call, 
and you go there, you know, ha always be ready, have, have a box or something ready. Um, and don't be afraid to screw up, you know, try to get to watch some videos, how people do it and don't, you know, just, just get them leads in there and, and do the best you can and don't worry about it. And, and, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of it. Like relax, catch some bees. Um, yeah, Montana's way different from here, so yeah. I can't give you too much advice on that. But getting free bees, I can tell you that. So yes. that was just. So Bruce is in Pennsylvania, and I got to know Bruce through a beekeeping group um, on Facebook. And the thing that I love about Bruce is that he is the opposite of me, and he balances me in the way that we approach beekeeping. So I get pretty heady. Um, with my beekeeping and reading lots of articles, studying the right ways to do things. And then Bruce is out there just like, just go do it. Just go do it. And so he really like kind of grounds me <laughs> so I don't get carried away with the science of bees and I just enjoy it. So um, he's a really great resource. And Bruce, I really appreciate you being here and helping and talking and everything you've taught me about bees. It's pretty awesome. Oh, you're welcome. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I've never been on this meat thing before. It's pretty great. I gotta do this again. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions or concerns about their bees? I know we've got a lot of people have new bees coming. Do you guys have any questions about that? I do. Um, so I'm getting two nukes on Sunday, and I have my whole setup ready. I have it over at a friend's farm. Um, and my question is, I pick up the nukes at about between one and two in the afternoon and I'm going to bring them home. And should I, should I wait until evening to put them in the, in the so hive? You, How do I, go ahead. Yeah. So good question. Good question. I was talking to Mark um, and Rachel about this before. You don't want to hive them the same day that you bring them home. They're going to be okay. irritated that you've had them in the car. They're going to be angry. If you lift the lid off, they're going to fly at that you and give you a hard time. So what okay. I want you to do is put them in the spot that they're going to end up in their hive. So push the, the, the hive out of the way. Put the okay. nuke in the spot. Go ahead and open them up, the entrance, not the top. Open the entrance up so that they can get out. They can orient, fly around. Um, and then you're going to let them sleep for the night. And then the next day you're going to sometime between 10 and five, when the weather's nice, you're going to put them in their new hive. Um, what you're okay. going to do, is you're going to um, um, put the frames in the middle. So take the, uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming they're five frame nukes. Yeah. yeah five I, frame. I think. Yeah. 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 They're five frame. You're going to take the five frames right out of the middle. Um, of the hive, if you have any in there, make a space. And you're going to take the five frames out of the nuke and put them in that space in the exact same order, same orientation that they were in the nuke. And then, okay. and then um, you should have some empty frames on either side of them. Um, so two and three on either side of them. And then you're gonna close them up. You're gonna have bees um, in the nuke box just mm -hmm. take a look in there and make sure you don't have the queen. You could tip it upside okay. down and give it a little pound if you want to get some okay. of the bees out, but that's not necessary. I'm more worried about the queen. We just kind of want to make sure that the queen goes in the box. Sure. The bees that are left in the new box, you're going to set them, the box, underneath the hive or leaning against the hive somewhere where that top of that box is pointing towards the entrance. Okay. And those bees will climb out of that box before nightfall and they will get in with their hive. Um, sometimes okay. you'll have a few bees that are confused that will insist on remaining in the box overnight. Um, if they survive to the next morning, they'll eventually find the rest of the hive up there. Okay. Great. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm ready, excited to, ready to get going. Um, and then, um, um, try to find your queen and get some eyes on her when you're putting her in. I'm, I'm sure that there will be one there successfully because mm -hmm. I think someone before they pass the nuke off to you, they usually check to make sure there's a viable queen. But I okay. think, are, are these nukes, where are you getting these nukes from? Plan B. Chuck. Yeah, Chuck. Right. 
So they're coming over from Great Falls. So yeah, yeah he's bringing just, them all the way here though, which is nice. Oh yeah. So I mean, that's quite a trip. So just to make mm -hmm. sure that you have a queen, because if you do not have a queen, if she got damaged in some way, you'll want to know right away. I believe that same gentleman that sold those nukes are selling queens for thirty dollars a piece, and so he would probably okay. have replacement queens right away for you that he could get you. Okay. Yeah. It's a. It's really helpful to take a small flashlight with you to check your queen to make sure she's she's alive. Uh, in her queen box, if that's how she's coming. That really helped me uh, because it, the, a lot of times they can't have a dead queen in there. So you may say, oh, I've got a queen. And then you get home and you realize she wasn't alive. But that little flashlight really helps on there. Oh, you're talking about with packages where the queen is in a queen cage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, Elizabeth's getting a nuke. So the queen will be free ranging. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right with packages. That is helpful. Any other questions about installation day? How often after, okay, the second day I go back and I hive them, how should I leave them alone for a while? I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, you probably should let them get. So um, um, new beekeepers tend to want to get in once a week to see how things are going. Um, that is not necessary for the bees to survive, but it's understandable because it's something you're gonna learn more the more you're in there. And so you you might be sacrificing the um, happiness of the bees a bit, but it's a good learning experience for you. Um, I don't know how true this is, but the claim, the rumor is that bees are set back one to two days every time you get in there. So they have one to two days of catch up where they want to, they're putting back in wax that you broke, mm -hmm. honey that you spilled, and propolis that you, you know, broke. So um, it, that's the good reason why you might not want to get in there a lot. Experienced beekeepers in the times of the year where an action might need to happen, get in there about every two weeks. And then when there's no action required, the bees are just being bees like in the middle of the summer, some people don't get in for a month, sometimes two months. So um, I would say for you, maybe give an inspect again in a week or 10 days, just so you can kind of learn, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but how often do I need to, you know, uh, check the food? How often would I need to replace the food? Oh, uh, I would say, so are you going to do the top feeder? Are you going to do something? I had I ordered the uh, the the front feeders the, that go the kind of upside down mason jar that slides in the front but I like that top feeder idea I saw something online about a ziploc bag and they just poked filled it with sugar water and just poked a toothpick in it three or four times and set it right on top of the frames do you know anything about that I know what you're talking about I saw that gentleman post that um I would be the type of person to completely botch that and drown the bees. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a nice hack. I mean, if you want to test it on a tabletop and make sure that it actually produces the nectar in a way that they can get to it and doesn't yeah. like spill and tear and roll. I, yeah. I don't know. But um, I mean, our, are you guys hurting for purchasing the feeders? No, I'd go ahead. No, I'd go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and get okay. the top feeders. Okay. All right. Because some, sometimes people are doing that because it's up to this point been a really expensive venture. You know, it has. It has. <laughs> <laughs> you do do the baggy feeder. If, if you do that baggy feeder, the way you have to do it so you don't make a big mess is fill the bag only halfway up before you zip zip lock it and lay it on top of your frames and then you have to have a really sharp razor blade and just make a little slit and it and then the like the surface tension of the syrup will keep it from spilling all over the place but your hive has to be perfectly level right so and i would imagine one little jostle and there it goes <laughs> yes I'm do that. I'm gonna put it nice and level and then you put just a little slit i don't know if, mm -hmm. i don't know if poking it would work if we squirt out all over you but um yeah, so if you do that, once you get like up to a high number of hives, you might do that. But if you do that, do that's all I was going to say. Yeah, I'll probably go with the top feeder. 
Um, yeah, so this time of year, we don't have a wasp problem. So um, you're not as worried about the raw bee from the wasps, but from other bees. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I, when I went out there and all I was doing was lifting frames and going through them to clear my dead outs, there, suddenly there were hundreds of bees everywhere on huh. me. And so, wow. yeah, so those Boardman feeders, um, I, so there's somebody on the presentation who shall rename, who shall remain nameless, who told me that he hated the front Boardman feeders and that I should not use them. And so of course I went and got them to prove him wrong. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and because I thought, well, that's only because people don't close up around the feeder. They, they you know, they're leaving way too, they're leaving it way too open. So I'm going to be tricky and I'm going to cut my um, entrance reducer down in such a way that it sits with the entrance reducer butted up against it. So it's not in the entrance. And, uh -huh. and then I proceeded to watch hundreds of bees come and try their hardest to get into the mason jar robbers and then start bawling with my bees on the front there. So mm. they can smell that sugar water through the seams of the mason jar. And yeah, wow. even though I had that thing, you know, what I thought was insulated well into the front there. So it really mm -hmm. does cause a problem and don't tell Bruce. Okay. <laughs> Do we need an entrance reducer right now? Um, I would suggest it, yes. It helps them um, regulate better um, in, for the temperatures. Um, they, they need to create a vection system. So what they do is they sit right by the entrance um, and that, that it's four inches long, half an inch tall. They sit by it and they fan and they create the circulation effect within the hive. That's compromised if that's completely open. It's harder for them to create that vection system okay. that they have to do. So yeah, I would suggest that you reduce it down. You can reduce it down to the somewhat larger size, which is four inches wide by half an inch tall. You can change it over to the even smaller entrance opening when we're starting to have problems with yellow jackets in the late okay. summer and fall. And, um, if anyone ever gives you advice about how much you vent your hives and how big the entrance is, um, first ask them, where do you live? And then if they don't say North Montana, don't listen to them because <laughs> we, we don't have the heat that's required the way that some people have to vent their hives, like cracking up the tops, opening that entrance up completely, opening vented bottoms up completely underneath. We just don't have those. We don't have the heat that maintains up here for that to be necessary. So I wouldn't worry about that kind of stuff. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, it's almost eight o'clock here. And for some people that are in the Eastern section, even later. So I guess we'll say good night for now. Um, I will put this entire recording of this presentation um, up on our website. And thanks everyone for coming. And please feel free to call me anytime if you have any questions in the process. And I will be uh, meeting with Mark. Um, thank you, Kimberly, for coming. And I'll be meeting um, you, Mark, um, virtually tomorrow as we plan out where you're going to put your hives. So, Sounds thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, there we go. I don't know.